So hello, everybody. I am here with J.F. Martel. J.F. Martel is a thinker. He's a filmmaker, uh, just a, a cultural theorist. He's written a book called Reclaiming Art in the Age of Artifice and also hosts a podcast called Weird Studies. The strange thing about J.F. is that several years ago, someone pointed me to him and said that we were like doppelgangers, that we really look like each other. Even my wife, when she saw a picture of him, thought, wow, this guy really looks like you. And what's interesting is that a lot of his ideas start from similar positions as mine. He talks about the world as story, about how you know reality is, is built out of story, and he comes to conclusions that are slightly different from me. So I think this is going to be a very interesting discussion. This is Jonathan Pajot. Welcome to the Symbolic World. Great. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And, and my wife said the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like brothers, more like yeah, exactly. Like, and we're also both French Canadian, which is just yeah. strange. So we, we should we come... be doing this in French. Yeah, it's a little awkward, but that we'll, we'll get the hang of it. We're both used to it. The thing is that, um, yeah, it, it, I guess it goes to show that we come, we come from a society that was until very recently, very homogenous, that we could look so similar and not have the same name, last name. Exactly. You probably have some bloodlines crossing at some point in the past. Oh, for sure. Yeah. In fact, I think you're only like a few hundred, you're, you're in the Eastern townships. Yeah. Is that where you, yeah. Well, so I grew I'm up in the Eastern township. So, yeah. oh, so I'm in Ottawa. So we're pretty close anyways. Yeah. So, <laughs> So you wrote a book called Reclaiming Art in the Age of Artifice, and I've heard you talk on several podcasts about a certain approach to reality, about reality being made of stories. So maybe you can lay out, you know, the basics of your idea, and then we can start to explore the kind of the similarities and differences with the things I'm talking about. Sure, sure. Um, so Reclaiming Art in the Age of Artifice is a book I wrote a few years ago now. Um, and the, the goal of the book was to I had been working in the media industry for some time at that point, and I'd become frustrated with the types of uh, questions that um, my, my, my fellow artists and I were getting from the people who were basically the gatekeepers of the industry, the types of things that we were asked to do. This is not new. Every artist knows this who's working in a big industry is that you start off with this vision, this idea of what you'd like to do. And then, of course, the, it's almost like you're holding a a candle and the industry is a, a maze and you you're, the goal is to somehow make it across to the other end with these howling winds through the tunnels with the candles still lit at the other end so i thought well that's and, and this is i think is a is something that a lot of artists have felt so i was just thinking about that and instead of going the usual route which is to say well that's just the egocentric artist wanting to control you know that not answering to the demands of culture but trying to get their own personal opinion across or their own personal vision but really the market knows what kind of art should be made and one should just kind of bow to that instead of going that route I decided to go the other route and I drew on the artists that I love um people like Oscar Wilde uh people like uh Albert Camus uh, uh, um, uh, Flannery O'Connor, you know, I remember the the artists that uh, that I was into at the time, Stanley Kubrick, you know, and and just going to see what 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 did they say about the process? And I found that often what they said resonated with what my artist friends and I were feeling. Um, and uh, they had just been the people who'd been able to make it across the maze with the candle still lit. And um, and so then I thought, well, what is it that we're doing? as artists. So I, I became interested in the question of art. And, and to be honest, this is a question that's preoccupied me for a long time since I was a teenager. I think that it's one, probably one of the archetypal dialogues you'll hear in a high school or cégep, right? It's the, what is art the conversation? Oh, that's art, that's not art, that sort of thing. Well, I decided to take that question seriously as a thought exercise at first, as a thought experiment. And then finally ended up, because I was writing for a magazine at the time called Reality Sandwich, I ended up getting an opportunity to write a book about that. And so I did. And, uh, and, uh, and so the book basically argues that um, art is a, 
a means by which the human being is able to capture, touch, uh, express the real with a capital R. So what is real? What is really real? Um, and that uh, art is innately um, spiritual and that uh, we have simply uh, forgotten that. And there's, there's something basically fundamentally subversive about art, about art in the sense that it shows us things outside of the usual frames of reference that we, we, we know them in. So it will take, for example, you know, the, the example I use in the book a few, on a few occasions is you'll have someone take a vase with sunflowers in it and transform it into a weird menagerie of alien monsters, right? <laughs> to transform them into something where the sunflower, which seems so known, so familiar to us, suddenly becomes strange again restored to its original strangeness because the theory is that we tend to project our concepts on things and then we reduce those things to those concepts and art is a way of getting through that interface that kind of uh, overlay of conceptual apprehension to get back to something like the original reality of creation right um and i'm not saying that there's a kind of gnosis in art but I'm saying that at least it shows us our unknowing. So it's like an antinosis. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it removes the, the idea that we can uh, know things with certainty. It mm -hmm. restores us to what in the book I call radical mystery. That's what art does. And that's how you can kind of distinguish something like uh, Guernica or the Sistine Chapel or uh, an icon from something like uh, a car commercial or a uh, that horrible milk commercial, I'm sure you remember in Canada with where they took Beethoven's ninth and turned it into, it was just the word milk being repeated over and over again uh, when we were kids. So like th that sort of thing, that type of propagandistic uh, type of art that tells you how to feel and think, which I, in the book, I call artifice. Mm -hmm. So it was an exercise in um, rehabilitating and weaponizing an adolescent, an adolescent feeling. Yeah. <laughs> and so one of the things that I've heard you say is is really this return to the phenomenological, which is something that I've been uh, helping, right. trying to get people to get back to, which is that the, the reality we have access to, the reality of these things that present themselves to us in terms of you know, the hot, cold, uh, inside, outside, these categories of experience, they're actually the, the first categories, right? They're the categories the world is made out of. The other categories, like the scientific categories are real, but they're secondary, let's say, to these first kind of uh, impressions, the, the, this world of, of phenomena that we deal with. Um, yeah. And so maybe, because you talk about the vase, I remember listening to you talk about the, the vase in, in this interview, and you mentioned how by framing it, let's say by putting it into an image and then having, you, having it called to your attention. So asking people to attend to it, then right. you're, you're, you're Making forcing the person to ask themselves what what is this like why is the vase there like in, a, in I think you remember in in this podcast I was listening to you're talking about a movie where the person uh, focuses on the vase for uh, too long like lingers on the vase with the camera and so you right. forced to ask yourself like why and therefore ask yourself well what is a vase like what is that what what what, what categories are kind of coming to us in terms of yeah. the vase the vessel right. Exactly. So, so you, it's, like, yeah. it's, a, it's something that holds something else. It's something that that is, uh, and, and therefore it becomes an, analogous to other vessels, right? You can think of a mother, or you can think of a, of a house, of anything the that ocean. holds something. Yeah. yeah. So there are all these different things that kind of flood in, these analogies that flood in, uh, which can kind of help you understand why a vase is important and also why it has, why we even have a category of vase. It, it basically, the image, um, turns the vase, the, the, I say vase, I had the same, I'll just say vase, just because uh, it's nicer, it's it turns, French, it's vase, or yeah, vase. It turns I'll the say vase. vase, just, I'll say vase. Yeah. No, let's just both, vase. let's read, yeah. let's, 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 uh, okay, so the vase is uh, transmuted in almost an alchemical way into a symbol, so in the book I talk a lot about signs and symbols, and that we usually live in a, a, for, a, a city of signs, um, a town with neon signs everywhere telling us what things are. Whether we're in the forest or in the, on a mountain, doesn't matter. We, we live in sign city. Uh, everything has its attributed meaning. Everything has a label attached to it. But then uh, 
sometimes in life for a moment, usually there's a kind of Satori moment or a moment of clarity where, oh my God, the strangeness of things comes back, comes to you. Uh, and that's, that's comes through what I, in the book, I, in art, it occurs through framing. You frame out something which normally would just be part of the decor of ordinary life. But once framed, it starts to um, emit what Thomas Aquinas called radiance, claritas. And that radiance does two things. Formally speaking, just by, the, by virtue of being framed, it calls you back to the original mystery of all things. It reminds you that we don't really know what anything is. We're kind of living in this mystery. Secondly, the, spe the specificity of the object in the frame, in this case, the vase, calls you to interpret, to ask about this object, this thing that you're looking at that you don't know anymore. And that's what occasions the, um, the, the, the process of symbolic thinking, of thinking in terms of analogy. Yep. And so you start to think about associations and, uh, and some, some, are, some associations have become classic. For example, the vessel, the mother, the ocean, right? The night, you know, the things that contain, the things that, um, and those associations have become quite standard. But, but my, my gambit uh, is that modern art, and it's at its best, uh, allows for new associations. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, so that, that there's never, uh, a, a, there's never a, a symbol dictionary that's complete, right? Yeah. That, that, that this is always in the process of being discovered and, and, uh, okay. And, so, yeah. Yeah. The, so yeah. this is, this is really, for me, it's very fascinating to hear you speak because what I hear when I listen to you is I hear kind of two things going on. And, and for me, at least the way that I've tried to present it has really been two things. And so right. this notion of the mystery or this kind of entering into the mystery, if you think of an ancient temple or, you know, a church, you have the space of mystery, which is the altar, let's say. And that's where the, the magical event happened, the, the event that binds us together as a community, the event that connects us to something higher. And, and so it is beyond description, although you can describe it, you know that it's also containing something which is leading beyond it, right? So higher yeah. up, okay. Um, Transcends, yeah. And so usually those, the analogies that go with that are kind of this moment of clarity that you talk about, or the moment of light, this idea of a beam of light or a vision, or uh, so there are all these uh, unveiling, you know, all these types of imagery. Um, right. And then there's another space, right, which is the space of the margin. And that's usually where the strange happens. And so that's where, like, for example, in medieval manuscripts, you had uh, monsters, right? You would have the, the marginalia, where you have all these mixed creatures, you have surprising, you have inversions, you have, uh, you know, uh, rabbits fighting men and, and, and all this strange stuff that happened in the margins. And you see it also in the, in the shape of the church. You have the same, you have the gargoyles on the, on the outside of the church. And so the gargoyles right. are this, this surprising hybrid uh strange right the weird the, the, this is the, that's where the weird kind of occurs um and so so to me there's like an there's an interesting thing because you you kind of join those together and i know that there's a way in which that's not completely off because the guardian like the the monster guardian like a cerberus or some other creature is usually represented it's like if you're going into the holy place right so if you're going into the mystery you'll encounter a monster because yes. he's protecting the holy place. And so you see the cherub on the veil of the temple, you know, the sphinx, the, the, these, 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 uh, these kind of uh, bull wing, bull creatures that you see in Mesopotamian temples, they're right. guarding, they're guarding the mystery. Um, but then when you go beyond, when you, you, you have to kind of pass them, they're like a veil. And then beyond that, there's the illumination, you would say. And then you, yes. then you, then you can grasp, let's say the vase, in it's in a way that is beyond all its particulars. So it's like you yes. grasp, you get this thing. It's like you this this and and you said gnosis. I'm totally fine with that term. Like you get this insight, which will then be it's beyond words and it's beyond the particular, and you get it. Uh, but what's fascinating to me is that for it seems like for you those two things are kind of the same. Yeah, yeah. The strangeness. Yeah, that, that's really. Uh, yeah, go for it. No, that's really interesting that you bring that up. Actually. Um, there's a uh, Protestant theologian, Rudolf Otto. I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but he, uh, he came up with a concept in his work, which he calls 
mysterium, the uh, calls it in Latin, mysterium fascinans et tremendum, the fascinating and terrible mystery. Mm -hmm. And he's, he, he, this is, um, this is in a work that explores, uh, that tries to capture the nature of the sacred. And what Otto argues is that the sacred is always a two-pronged thing. Mm -hmm. The sacred reveals itself as fascinating in the, in, a, in the positive sense, not in the sense of casting a magic spell, but in the sense, the sense of that Aquinas means by illuminating. It draws you in. It, 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 is, um, it is a night type of gnosis. It, mm -hmm. it confirms something that you could only dream and hope was true and shows it to you in a way that's beyond words. At the same time, strangely, mysteriously, it is also terrible because the sacrifice it asks of you is, uh, is, is terrible. It's like Abram and Isaac, Isaac material, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's both. And mm -hmm. um, I tend to be, um, this is super interesting that you brought, you kind of put your finger right on it there, I think, between when it comes to, to the two of us and the way we approach these things, I think you're right. I tend to be more Manichaean uh, or I, I'll, which means more dualistic mm -hmm. about this thing um, because I am uncertain as to whether the real capital R, the ultimate is something that would be, that is, um, is something that would bring one joy or absolute horror. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't right. know that. I believe that it's good. That's why I'm a practicing <laughs> Catholic but I don't know it. I don't feel it. I feel like there's a chance that the illumination, if, if it were complete, would be like what the Germans experienced at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, for sure, there's that threat in scripture and that threat in, right. in, uh, in the, the idea of, the, of God or, or th this idea of the, the revelation uh, of Vishnu, right in in where he removes his mask, and then you know this thing that 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 uh, that is seen by Nagarjuna is like this. I, forget, I think that's his name. Is like this yeah. this insane thing, uh, and you get the sense of that in scripture as well, where God, you know, when someone asks to see God's face, God says, "You can't. If you see my face, it's going to destroy you." Uh, right. And it seems like, at least in Christianity, that all of that gets resolved or resolved. It's not. Re it's resolved in the sense that it's brought together in the cross. Mm -hmm. uh, which yeah. is that moment where death and glory are joined together and that moment where the horror and the highest thing are kind of joined together in one image. Um, and so I think I agree with you in that sense that, that there is something, and there's also this idea of the, the, the relationship between the divine darkness and the, the divine light. And you see that, I talk about that quite a bit because I have a carve icons. And so I actually make opaque images. People always talk about icons as windows to heaven and I'm like, well, I make carvings. And so it's more, it has more to do with this. In in the old testament, there's a there are certain certain places where when God's glory comes, it's like a darkness. It's like right. this darkness which comes in. And yeah. it, sometimes it's both like in the transfiguration of Christ, it says they were they were overshadowed by light. But it's like a cloud of light. And so it's right. both a dark and light. It's like something which shadows you, which stops you from seeing the light, but also you see the light. So it's like this. I, I, yeah. I see what you're talking about in terms of the duality of the, of the revelation, let's say. Right. Right. Well, I'm glad. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm just, um, and, and you, you say that Christianity resolves it. I think that you're right. I think that Christianity resolves it. Uh, but I guess I'm just not um, <laughs> quite sure that, that uh, uh, Christianity's right. <laughs> Christianity's right in the, in what sense do you mean? I just, I, I'm just much more ambiguous with, well, like, I, like again, I'll say I'm, I am a Christian, but I'm a Christian. I mean, Dostoevsky said that, uh, he says, my hosannas were forged in the immense furnace of doubt. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm still in the immense furnace of doubt. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and so I, but what I, what I love about, and also I wouldn't want it any other way in the sense that, I think that um, it is important that we, that the, ex the spirit of exploration that characterizes the human um, 
is given is vindicated and allowed to go the whole way. Mm -hmm. Some of my favorite Christian writers, most of them became Christians after they at the end of their careers are the decadent writers of mm -hmm. the late 19th century, people like J.K. Wiesman. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, and uh, and also like Aubrey Beardsley and uh, people who realized at the height really of that moment where the modern f kicks into full gear, right? The end of the 19th century. These guys realized that in order to affirm meaning again, we would have to affirm the, the most awful meaning. We would have to affirm sin and darkness and evil in order for the axis of good and evil to even exist. We have to go down there. And I think that they, I don't know how conscious of it they were, but when you look at the work, you look at Riesman's series of novels from Arabul to the late works where he was basically, a, I think not an a abbot, monk. but a, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah a, like a lay monk. Yeah, lay um, monk. yeah. he, uh, there's a there's a movement there that's very important, and I think that the way for a modern to re-enter, uh, to rediscover what there is to discover in those old religious traditions, I think that that path, the left-hand path, as they call it in magic, is is a, a super risky, but um, some sometimes maybe necessary one. And mm -hmm. so I, I, I'm kind of that's why I'm I, I'll, I'll emphasize the unseeable face of God and point out that that face is unseeable because it's monstrous. And I, I emphasize that side, but that doesn't mean I disagree with you at, in yeah. the least. I agree with you a hundred percent. Yeah. Well, we, it's like, I always try to remind people that we do eat the blood and body of Christ. Right? Right. <laughs> That's the highest sacrament. It's like, it is, you can say that it doesn't refer to cannibalism at all, but that would be actually missing the point of how, Christ unites the extremes in his person and in and in his sacraments ultimately. Right. Um, right. But the thing that I'm worried about mostly is that there is this image of, especially in exploring the darker aspects, like there is this image of of losing yourself, you know, because <laughs> that's the imagery of the demonic or these these hybrid creatures that appear. You see in these images of hell of like early Renaissance or late medieval images of hell, these kind of monstrous hybrids and all of this exploration. Um, it, interestingly enough, before they were actually almost more positive, these monsters, because they were just in the margins of the doc, of the document. Like they were not just not in hell in the sense of the, the this, in, just in terms of negative, they were just ontologically on the edge. And so they just right. created a border for, for the They for were the peripheral. Edge. Yeah, yeah right. this peripheral yeah. kind of, 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 of weirdness that appeared on the edge. Uh, and so it's th the highest version of that, I think, is, I don't know if you've seen, heard me talk about St. Christopher, which is something that I've been trying to talk about quite a bit. So St. Christopher is a, a giant in some traditions, but he's also a dog-headed man in other traditions. Mm. And so he is this kind of monstrous dog-headed creature who, uh, in, in the legend, he works, he's looking for the strongest king and he ends up like actually working for Satan. And then finally, he's looking to work for the strongest king, but he ends up submitting to the baby by crossing this child across the river. Uh, and then, and, and there are versions of, of it where he's a giant other that he's a, like the giant dog headed monster. So the idea is that the monstrous or the, the, the hybrid, it's best possibility is a bridge because right. it's on the edge. And so it can actually carry the logos or the light or the divine revelation further out into the world. But mm. it also guards you. It, it also is like a, it's like a, it, a guard against improper, yeah. Im improper, uh, you know, say defamation or like you know desacralization, something like that. Right. Well, it's kind of like reminds me of what McLuhan was saying about artists that that are you know, Marshall McLuhan, the Canadian yeah. media theorist, right? Whom you've discussed on your show, and I really enjoyed the interview you did, you did with what was the name of the scholar? Christian Roy. Yeah. Christian Roy. Right. Yeah, he's Christian great. would be someone you would really like to talk to, by the way, because he's he's uh, he's very interested in in similar subject in the same right. subject as you. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, the the McLuhan described the artist as a probe um, or as an what is it? I um, uh, can't remember the term he used, like something long distance early warning system or something like that. That's what he described art, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, and so the but the the probe 
um, it goes out into the chaos, into the margins, into the areas that we don't know, and incurs a risk by doing that. Um, there is a risk. I, I ultimately think that if you're going to turn a sign, and again, for your listeners who aren't familiar, like a sign is just basically the way we conceptualize a particular object in the world, like this lamp I'm looking at here or mm -hmm. the screen. It's all very clear to me. There's, I see it and I see the label so, uh, screen, right? I don't need to think about it. I can just go about my day and use mm -hmm. it. Um, but in order for to take a sign, let's say, let's go back to the vase of sunflowers mm -hmm. and transform it into a symbol, the process by which that happens, I've discovered, or I've is that the sign needs to move through a zone of indeterminacy. The, so the sign can't go from sign to symbol, like a light switch. Mm -hmm. It has to first become monstrous. Uh, it has to go into a place where you don't recognize it anymore. And I think any artist will recognize that moment where they look at their work and they don't know what they're looking at anymore. Like none of it makes sense. Like everything looks off. And that's the, in a way, that's kind of a sign that you're moving towards the something new right there needs to be a place where you don't a moment where you don't know anymore what you're looking at yeah and, and and i think that that process of of sending things that are familiar into the depths where they become unfamiliar is mm -hmm. dangerous and i don't think it's a coincidence that mental illness is is prevalent is related to artists it's related yeah. to artists yeah. uh, because there's that risk um and so kind of you have to become a kind of dog-headed monster a little bit mm -hmm. um and and that's 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 okay, but there is a risk, and the risk is real. And I don't want to try to say like that the risk is, uh, yeah. I don't. I wouldn't want to try to imply that the risk isn't real because it yeah. is. <laughs> and a way, all. like a way to to say it that might surprise you is the idea of of baptizing something, because right. that's what baptism is, right? You don't see the symbolism as much in Catholic baptism, but. Let's say in Orthodox baptism, baptism is a descent into the waters, right? You right. You go down into the waters and there are these, you know, there are these little river gods that are there. Uh, you see in the icon of Christ, you see these little kind of ancient uh, Roman river gods that are kind of down there. And so when, you, and there's prayers like at the beginning of baptism where you chase out the, the dragon from the waters before the person cool. goes down. And so the idea is that when you go down, when you bring something down to reform it, like you said, there's a danger in that in that moment, that moment of unformedness. Uh, we usually tend to focus just on the coming out and this kind of, this re coming back into light and then having this insight or having this higher insight about the thing. But we, you're right, even myself, I don't tend to talk about the, the unformed part. You know, if I carve an yeah. icon, at, you know, then that piece of, of stone is, is quite pristine, right, before I start. And in between yeah. the piece of stone <laughs> and the final thing, there's a lot of messiness that happens in that pro in that moment. Right, right, and, and and there are the process asks of you uh, something that uh, I've been talking with uh, an Australian artist named uh, Andrew Antonio. He's a very talented surreal surrealist kind of painter, um, and he uh, yeah he was talking to me yesterday about the the confrontations the the paths you find that you know that if you follow that path too far, it might lead to something that you're not ready for, right? There's a whole interior world. And I think there's something else that art tells us, whether it's uh, liturgical art or wonderful secular art. I, don't, I actually don't think there's a difference. I think art, I, think, I, don't, I don't think there's any such thing as profane art. Uh, my personal theory is that art is inherently sacred if it's real art, you know, um, but then you have to get into the, the, the unpleasant game of, of defining that, but whatever. <laughs> um, but he was, uh, where was I going? I totally lost my train your, of thought. Your, your Australian friend who talked yeah, was, about the danger of going in a certain right, direction. The, the danger, right, that there are, um, that there, there's a, that artists calls us to um, develop and explore our, our interiority which is probably the biggest problem we have today is that we there's a full on assault going on on interiority in our culture. Uh, we are being called to think of ourselves as um, purely external creatures, like completely oriented to what's outside. Um, there's very little in our culture, especially now with the advent of, of ubiquitous digital culture. There's very little opportunity for people to go in uh, and art requires you, if you're going to do it properly, to go in. And going in is 
there's a reason we don't want to do it. It's mm -hmm. not pleasant. Uh, it can lead to all kinds of um, strange and unpleasant discoveries. And but the but the, the the theory is or the gamble is that it's worse not to do it than to do it. As bad as it is to go inside, uh, it would be worse not to, because yeah. then of course all your horrors will manifest externally. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's 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 fascinating because I I I I kind of. I found my own kind of solution to that, which we pro you probably won't agree with me, but for me, the, 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 the solution that I came to in terms of art, first of all, in terms of the problem of art and artifice is right. my, the discovery of more traditional art or liturgical art, for example, actually breaks down that barrier, right? In terms of the difference between, let's say an object of consumption, the, the way that we think of it, you know, like a, how now we have objects of consumption and then we also have uh, our, our things that are there to give you a message. And then we also have the high art, let's say, that is supposed to be more exploratory. In liturgical art, they kind of joins together because the object you make is going to be used. It doesn't yes. just, it's not just looked at, right? It, it's not just like, a, it's like not just like an object of contemplation, but it's going to be used in the prayer. It's going to be used in the liturgy. And so it it, it kind of, binds the different aspects of, of art together in, in yes. objects. Yes, and um, I, I think that's fine. I think that's that's an important point, and I think that's good. Uh, I just think that we've lost our way of discussing that part of the liturgical art that isn't artifice. Yeah. The, the claritas part, the, the, the art part, is what we've lost the words or signs to, to determine. But that's what I'm trying to recover. Mm -hmm. I perfectly agree with you that a work of art can be also a work of artifice in the sense that it can have an instructive or functional role to play in a particular context. Nevertheless, there's a difference between a good icon and a bad icon. Oh yeah, for sure. And, and how do we talk about that? Right. Yeah, and exactly. you evolve. I mean, most people look at Orthodox icons and they just see the same thing, right? Yeah. But as a, I'm sure that as an icon, what well, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that as an icon artist yourself, as someone who is a carver in the Orthodox tradition, you're very much aware of the subtle differences that makes, I don't know, like an Andre Rublev different from someone else's icon. Um, it's no, what, it's definitely what no. There's definitely yeah. there's definitely something that yeah. makes that makes a there's definitely a a a difference between a very bad icon and a good icon. The, the strangeness is that it seems that it seems that in terms of uh, like let's say in terms of miracles it doesn't matter <laughs> and so no. like so some of the really worst icons become like these centers of pilgrimage people yeah. like have these and then it's like it becomes the center of a whole community and you think wow that's wonderful and then but you're something in your mind telling you yourself it's still a bad icon like, yeah exactly yeah. even if like yeah. i recognize this is amazing and all these people loving each other and kind of surrounding this thing it's it's great but still it's a it's a bad icon yeah um, that's a great point though because <laughs> it, it goes to show that yeah yeah that's that they're nonetheless and there are ways like there are reasons why we recognize certain artists as being like rublev for example is a great example uh he was the joining, he kind of joined everything together because he was really recognized as a holy person early on. And he actually is canonized now. He's a, he's a saint. Like you can get an icon of Rublev, of him, like not just his icon, but of, of his portrait. Uh, but he also was recognized as someone to copy. And so, but his work is very different from what came before. So it's actually, there's quite a, a lot of innovation in his work, but he was rapidly recognized as something that was setting a new, path that that those that aren't so good need to follow it's like right here is something that's really kind of showing itself brightly and then telling all these other artists that are mediocre to say okay just look at rublev like follow rublev right. these are like church councils saying that like church right. uh, moscow council saying look at rublev copy rublev because a lot Fantastic. of you guys are just off the off the rails in terms well, of your that, icon well that gives the lie to the popular idea that icon art has never changed uh, because it does innovate in ways, but it innovates through, uh, I guess you call it through a kind of grace. Uh, it's not, it's not, a, it's not about individual self-expression. It's not like Rublev's like, I'm going to do things my right. way. No. It's more like he had, he, he, he encountered a problem uh, and he found, he, he, 
he received a solution, right? Yeah. And that's how art evolves. And I, I think that that's more common in secular art than we think mm -hmm. is what I think. Because, and I totally think, I, I think I completely understand why you found, because I know you started in contemporary art and then you've discovered traditional art um, and, and went into that world. And I, I can see uh, why one would do that because they're the, these ideas that we're talking about aren't that foreign there. There's, that's kind of like, yeah, art doesn't come from individual human beings. It comes from beyond. Um, in the secular culture, we have no language to discuss this. Nevertheless, we have things like Guernica, you know, Picasso's Guernica or um, uh, Moby Dick, you know, or Hamlet, I don't know, like, or an Emily Dickinson poem. It's like yeah. eight lines. These things, uh, they, they too reveal things to us. And so we have to be able to, 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 to figure out what it is that's going on in secular art that it's so unsecular. Yeah. Um, it just can't be secular. Um, it has to call us back to the mystery yeah. uh, and to the sacred. And I think you're right. And there, there are artists that are doing that now. I think one of the difficulties of the modern time is, first of all, it was this race towards genius and this race towards the personal and so, you know, this idea of, especially you see, you see it in abstract expression is expression is the most where they, they have all these artists that have this like one characteristic style, and then you recognize their paintings. And then they, it's like, it's as if their whole person gets embodied in this style. And, and then it becomes a marketing ploy. It's like, it becomes an easy way to market them as well yeah. and sell their paintings for millions of dollars. But you see that already in the early 20th century with a lot of the, the early modernists. Um, but there are some things that I think even in liturgical art that they discovered or that they brought forth, it can be recuperated. And so I know some, um, I know some icon painters that are using Rothko in terms of, you know, uh, Rothko's ideas of push and pull and, and this notion of how space and color interact with each other. And so, but now more subtly to the service of something which they think is more communal and is more kind of bringing people together, um, and I think the same thing happens with Cubism and with the early, mm -hmm. the early kind of formal developments that happen in modernism. My I own like you. take on it was that, especially arriving in the in the like early two thousands or like late nineties, I, I felt like there was just nothing else happening. Yeah, that they, like people were regurgitating Marcel Duchamp in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And and the painters were all regurgitating the early modernists in one way or the other. And so I thought, so how did this happen? Like what happened? Because there was this race at the beginning of the 20th century towards this radical innovation and this, this surprise of the new. Uh, mm. And then it actually, it seems like it actually kind of petered out even before World War II. And then after World War II, then it's just like, because any everything Warhol did was already in data. Like that's yeah. fine. Is War, 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 no, I agree. You know. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So I don't know how do you, especially in terms because you're not necessarily a visual artist, but like in terms of visual art, to me, it seemed like even in terms of visual innovation, they they it's like it was like this quick burning, uh, you know, thing that they lit and it went, whew, and then it was yeah. over. And now people were being traditionalists about breaking tradition. It was it was like this strange uh, this strange way of thinking. I think that uh, I, I mean that that's a that's a huge question that we could discuss for hours, but I think that one quick answer that I'd like to give, like the venture uh, a theory, I guess, is that um, I tend to think that changes in art happen in poetry first. Mm -hmm. So, um, and or at least that's where they become more noticeable. In this case, I would think that if you look at Paris in the mid nineteenth century. Uh, in London a little later, and Germany, of course, um, you'll find the, I'll go back to the, the, the whole idea of decadence, right? Um, of these uh, decadent literature, decadent poetry. What is the archetypal figure of decadent poetry? It is the anemic, uh, last in line aristocrat, the last of his house, who is so bored with life, with modernity, that all that's left for him is sensual pleasure. 
And so like Riesmann's character is the ultimate. He locks himself up in a palace of strange curiosities, bizarre, grotesque plants and like turtles inlaid with gold and all kinds of queer. And he just luxuriates in this pleasure of the senses until finally he can just die uh, because there's nothing left of the world. There's mm -hmm. nothing left except surfaces. Um, Acedia, right? This is the, the way the monks, the monks yeah. who suffered from this condition yeah. in the Middle Ages were, they, they, they were yeah. told that they suffered from them called acedia. It's, it's the disease of our age, pretty much. Acedia. Yes. <laughs> and then what you see in afterwards, and this, you know, what you see is like Dada is the kind of codification of that mm. decadent feeling, affect that was new when, when Baudelaire and Wiesmann and, and Poe were talking about it. It, it, it. All of a sudden it's codified, it's instrumentalized, and it happens to serve uh, commo a, a commodity culture very well. Um, a culture that's completely, uh, in fact, you know, the whole Dada dream of a world of, of, of obliterating the line between art and life, we've accomplished that. Mm -hmm. We live in the utopia of the Dadas and the situationists in a way. Uh, we live in a world where there's no more boundary between art and life. Um, between, uh, uh, yeah, so, 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 so I think that the, that acedia, which the, those, those decadent poets, poets explored first, then just became a generalized social phenomenon. And you, and you see it play out in all these crazy uh, theatrical, uh, weird theatrical uh, events like, uh, like the Nazi rallies or like that ridiculous shit we saw in Washington a few weeks ago. This type of like pretending to care about, pretending to be part of, of history, like fabricating events, trying to get us to feel something again. Mm. Um, I think that we're just apathetic as a culture and we need to wake up um, and... Uh, and that, that's that's my my take on that. <laughs> your, may, your final <laughs> word is that we need to wake up. I agree. I yeah. totally agree. Uh, yeah. I tend to see, and, and that maybe brings me to also to the one of the aspects that I've been trying to develop, which is art as participation. Mm, uh, yeah. You know, one of the things that I've been trying to point people towards is the difference between the modern notion of art as a kind of aesthetic experience or an exterior aesthetic experience, you know, going to the opera, going to the concert, looking at a movie, watching a movie, all of this is different from the participative art that ancient cultures had, or, you know, that the idea of a dance or, you know, or singing folk songs together or you know, sitting around a fire and, and, and celebrating our stories, right? You know, mm -hmm. even the Iliad was sung, right? People didn't read it. They, they would have bards that would come and would sing it to them because it was their story and they would kind of have this participation. And mm -hmm. I think that, like you said, one of the difficulties of something like the, the, the fascist tendency is in noticing the vacuousness of, let's say, pleasure, this kind of exterior pleasure, this surface pleasure and the, the entertainment culture that we, we right. embodied is this desire to participate and they're looking for places to enter into the story yes. and the political sphere is an easy and scary place to enter into the story where you take a side you have a bad guy you have an enemy you know you 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 can even make them really really evil like in terms of the q type people and yeah. then you know where you are and who you're fighting and what you're doing and so it makes you feel alive in a way that uh that I can I can sympathize with, but also is extremely dangerous because it's very limited. It's it's limited and it's it's fundamentally it gets it gets everything exactly half right and exactly half wrong. Exactly. Right. So so being half right is not a good thing in no. life. It's like the worst. It's worse. It's better to be it's fully wrong be than wrong. being half right. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, so is there corruption at the top on both sides of the aisle politically? Of course there is. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and, and so, but the, there's, that's where subtlety becomes very important, you know, and, and looking at yourself becomes very important and not also the holier than thou feeling that the, the, the fascist sentiment encourages that we are the pure and they are the impure. And all of a sudden, all of the stuff that we can't acknowledge about ourselves gets projected onto yeah, yeah, the yeah. other. Not a good thing, not yeah. a good path. It's, yeah. Yeah. But it, that's why, like, for example, when I talk about the church building, let's say, and I try to get people to kind of 
experience it because it's not i talk about it but it's also experiencing it is that the right. the church building let's say the way it's built like in, when you enter in, into it it has three parts it has the altar it has the nave and then has the narthex that's the those are the main parts and the narthex is that place of relationship with the outside where the monsters appear you know the gargoyles and all of this stuff and so there's a hierarchy of being but it's not a it's not a simple in out identity right it's not a simple us them because it's it's actually a hierarchy which moves out into the outside and into the ind indifferentiated possibilities which lay outside of my identity right. uh, and so it's a healthier way to encounter identity and some people will will um will object because there is to a certain extent a recognition of the monstrosity of the strange like and when i encounter something that i don't recognize like a stranger there is something monstrous of that but if right. i know that that monstrosity is also is also part of how it like i recognize it right it's structural it's right. just structural it's there and so right. i see the stranger and i recognize oh that's weird and then it's like, okay, well now move on. Like it's, it's, I don't have to- I can to, get over it. I don't, like I don't have it, yeah. to necessarily like throw a lance at it, right? It, right. It's just part of like, <laughs> just part of how the world lays itself out. And the idea yeah. of having like a saint, like St. Christopher or certain other, you know, St. Moses, the, the Ethiopian, certain- Moses uh, with the horns too, uh, the Old Testament Moses. The, uh, the Mo yeah, Moses who yeah. came down with horns there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a fascinating story. But yeah. so to me, it's more like trying to get people to go back into- a proper story like not the not the weird nationalistic story but a story which has this this space for the strange but it also looks towards the altar right that it's not completely fascinated with the snake either because like i need to my my opinion that can be very dangerous because it because those oh, monsters can also eat you like they really no, no, yeah. yeah absolutely i absolutely that's the great hope is that that uh you're right about all this <laughs> It's like my hope is it's that our you're great, right about it. It's our great hope. Uh, like I agree with you, and I think that it's speaking to the the importance of participation, which I think is really important. I think I saw you talk about this in a talk sometime. Uh, how traditional art is participatory, so it invites. I, I think that's that's key. Um, I think that good uh, secular. I don't like to use that word secular, but let's say non traditional art, or um, I even think that. That's wrong. I think there's a tradition even in secular art. Yeah, but yeah, anyways, like, sure. yeah. Uh, in all art, there's a participatory call. There's a call to participate. Um, I wouldn't want somebody to read me Moby Dick because it would take a week, but I love to be able to sit down and read it. I don't think the technology of the novel, although it's not an oral technology, still there's participates in yeah. of that. Yeah, there's something about that. So and, and and something's going on in that book. Uh, mm -hmm. Of all books, I think that it's the closest I've read to uh, kind of prof uh, not profane but secular scripture in a yeah. weird way. And it's and not the, but there is at something. All. <laughs> th there is even in terms of like uh, the idea of the monstrous, like the idea that the monstrous were in, in the ornaments in medieval manuscripts. Like th there was a relationship between ornamentation and the monstrous. There is also mm. something inevitable about the secular. Uh, like there's something about how Gauguin used to say he was a decorator, and 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 I actually think that's a really interesting idea. Mm, it's like he yeah. said, there's a role for ornamentation, and and it's kind of, I wouldn't call it vain beauty, but a, a kind of a, a recognition of the sensual yes. aspect of reality. Yes. Uh, but it's also a decorative. It's also decorative. Like it's it's something you do after at the end of the day, right? It's like it's it's like the the rest you need the house the you need the house before you can decorate it so the house has to stand you need you exactly you need you the house be, that's a good yeah they can't be built on sand right yeah, yeah. uh so but uh, about the participation thing that there's a difference between uh, there are different types of participation mm -hmm. uh in sociology they have a term communitas right which uh um means uh the, you know when you, you go into a, a place and you feel like you're together with everybody everybody's on the same page on the same wavelength there's this feeling of community that develops that, that suddenly spontaneously appears it can go it can be there are different types and the type of communitas that i've experienced in in religion um in my own religious practice which is catholic but it's obviously uh, available in orthodoxy but also in i, I would argue in buddhism and hinduism and what what a is that it gives you community, it's a community of aloneness. 
um, as opposed to a Dionysiac fury Minad like wild community of the of the of the pack or the herd. Mm -hmm. um, you know the the Greeks talked about the the Minads, which the women who follow Dionysus and who go into we go into this this nocturnal frenzy and like rampage Rich through the woods and yeah. tear men to pieces yeah. if they found them or animals like just yeah. yeah right so so that's communitas too that's a type of community. Um, but, uh, and, and the Greeks were willing to recognize that that existed, but of course there was always the, how do we try to contain <laughs> this? There's a bit of a danger there. Yeah. So, so, so the, uh, the, but the type of community I've felt in religion is very different. It's not so much that I'm with everybody here. We're all one tribe. Mm -hmm. It's more like we're together to the extent that at this moment, we realize that we're all kind of alone facing this thing. And the call is being made to each individual and personally. And I try to argue in my book that art is similar to that. That Mo Mel Herman Melville didn't write Moby Dick, despite what he thought, didn't write Moby Dick for a mass of people. He, I think he sold like a couple of thousand copies in his lifetime and died very poor. He wrote it for one person. And I think that the, the, the proper way to approach a work of art is to assume, because your guess is as good as anybody else. Assume that that person was you. Approach the book as though it was written for you. That's, it was it, with that attitude when I read the Bible that I was finally able to understand what my religion had been trying to tell me all along. It's not about judging other people. It's about mm -hmm. you, yeah, right? Sure. And you're alone. And in the, in the moment of communitas in a proper, I would argue in a proper art context, Communitas brings us back to our aloneness, and it's our aloneness that we share, not this kind of tribal, nationalistic uh, togetherness that 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 that, ab that absolves us of responsibility as individuals. Yeah. Well, the, I would say that the the Christian idea of love it does in fact try to balance out the the this the two extremes, like the mm. the the idea of a solipsism or this kind of just single. Uh, radical loneliness and the the fusion this tribal fusion that you talk about you know in the yeah i think that's what Greek i'm trying to get at right is and so it, yeah the trinity so in the trinity that seems to be what is expressed at the highest level it's like mm -hmm. a radical radical union with radical separation right so it's like there's no confusion between the persons but they are completely one and that yeah. seems to be what we're called to do as christians and the way that it re reveals itself to us or the way that it's supposed to be lived is actually through self-sacrifice. Like the way that I'm not alone is the way that I love others. So it's mm -hmm. no, it's not so much the what I get from others that makes me not alone. It's what I give and, and how I'm willing to, to kind of open and give myself to, to those around me. That is what connects me to them. And so right. it's a, it's a weird, it's like an inversion of the passionate party, like of the, you know, of this, of the rave where everybody is all fused in the beat, but they're all there to kind of get as much pleasure as they can in that moment, you know? Right. Right. No, that's, that's a very good point. Yeah. I, I fully agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, look, I think we've been going for quite a while. This has been a very interesting discussion. I'm, I'm happy that I finally talked to my, to my uh, doppelganger and uh and i it's funny because i didn't know that you were a catholic like i didn't even know that you were uh that you were a practicing catholic i just mm. saw i just saw your, your your talk about weird stuff and i and i guess it makes sense then that you would be on the makers and mystic podcast because i guess it's mostly a kind of a like a christian podcast but um yes but i mean weird studies is uh i, I co-host weird studies with phil ford who is a musicologist um at Indiana University Bloomington and he is uh, he's a Buddhist so um, we uh, we like to explore the the in-betweens of things right the strangeness of yeah, things the strangeness of things that's what that's what gets me off it's weirdness <laughs> what can I say <laughs> so so uh, tell people where they can find your stuff like do you have a website do you have a yeah, I have a website that I haven't updated in forever called Reclaiming Art. Uh, it, it, the address is reclaimingart.com, reclaimingart.com. And uh, Weird Studies, weirdstudies.com is probably the best way to find me these days. Um, uh, that's our, our our podcast that I co-host with Phil Ford. And and aside from that, yeah, if you just, yeah, I've written a few things. You could probably track down some articles and essays if you're interested. And of course, my book, Reclaiming Art in the Age of Artifice is available at all 
virtual oh, bookstore. Well, virtual bookstore. <laughs> it's and literally we're... available in no single physical bookstore. Exactly. Right now, unless you pick and, them up outside. And we're going to, and we're both actually going to be part of the Mystic Makers and Mystics event that they're doing in March. So people right. could stay tuned to that. There'll probably be some some uh, social media posting about it. And we're, we're, Jeff and I will both be speaking at that event and with questions appear, question periods and stuff. Too bad that we're not in the same place. It would have been nice to meet you in person and, and right. to, to shake your hand. Well, we're, we're almost neighbors. So once this all ends, this ridiculousness, then we'll be able to meet. <laughs> that would be great. That would be great. So thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed my discussion with J.F. Martel. You might have noticed the most recent opening of my YouTube channels, which was made by Jack Wilmot. Jack Wilmot runs a YouTube, very successful YouTube channel called the Disrupt YouTube channel, where he does some gaming and some VR stuff. And so he, he made this for me, which I find it very interesting. And so I'd like to hear your comments about it below in the comment section. And as you know, everything we do in the symbolic world is due to your support. So go check out the symbolicworld.com slash support if you want to help out this project. We've got a lot of things on the line in the future, including more French content, translation of the website, more involvement as well in terms of all the other stuff that, that has been around the symbolic world. So thanks again, and I will talk to you very soon.